Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Graciela Chijolniski. She's the CEO and co-founder of Global Thermostat. Uh, she's a professor of economics and statistics at Columbia University. So uh, welcome, Graciela. How are you doing? Hello. Yeah. So if, if you would tell me about your uh, your work and what, what's the premise of Global Thermostat? Yeah. The premise of Global Thermostat is that the world needs to remove a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere, and it is possible to change the economy so that we can do it while creating economic development and jobs. So that is not just the premise, but it's also the mission of Global Thermostat. So uh, is it commonly thought that in order to control our climate and to prevent it from warming, that we have to sacrifice economic activity? Yes, in fact, there is a law that was passed in 1997 both in the co- in Congress in the United States, saying that there will be no limitation on emissions in the United States if it has a negative impact on the economy. And it was assumed that it does. And therefore, due to that bird hegel law that I just mentioned, the United States never participated in the limitations of emissions, which had dire consequences worldwide. If you wish, Global Thermostat is standing Bert Hegel on its head because it's saying you can actually limit emissions, you can actually decrease the CO2 in the atmosphere and clean the atmosphere while helping the economy and the creation of jobs. So it really uh, is a real reversal of the Bert Hegel law. Was it a law or was it just a postulate? Like, why would they say that you can't improve the climate without affecting the economy negatively? Yeah, it's a law. That was the same day, the same date, 1997, that um, the Kyoto Protocol was passed in Kyoto. And the carbon market was created on the basis of limiting emissions and letting emissions pay when they went above their limit and receive when they were below their limit. So that carbon market, which in fact I wrote into the Kyoto Protocol, was accepted by 165 nations and it became the first law based on a new market, international law, in 2005. And it was very successful. And as of the year 2020, the nations that ratified that law and followed it, decreased their emissions by 20% in the 15 years since 2005. So they are now emitting 20% less than what they were emitting in 2005. And that includes all of the European Union. However, the nations that didn't uh, use the carbon market, which was so successful, and include the United States, they actually increase radically their emissions. So you could say ah. that the bird hegel law was the dividing line between success and failure in, the, uh, in removing the catastrophic risk of climate change. So was it was like a, a cap and trade type law or what was it? Did it just set a fixed quota per country on carbon emissions or what was it like? No. In the year 1997, for the first time in the history of humankind, the carbon market, which you call cap and trade, was created. It didn't exist before then. And it was created in the Convention of the Parties of the United Nations, November 
uh, to the November 1997. So it didn't exist until then. In fact, I wrote it. In fact, I designed it and wrote it into the Kyoto Protocol. But the law was in US Congress said, had a blanket statement, no emission limits if they hurt the economy. There was an assumption that they would hurt the economy. And even until now, if you speak with 100% of the people you speak with, they believe that limiting emissions is going to be punishing for the economy. What I'm here to say is that global thermostat is based on the premise and the mission of exactly the opposite, namely economic progress that limits emissions and cleans the atmosphere. Therefore, as I said, setting the bird hegel Act on its head. So um, the provisions were that if, um, if a country felt that reducing emissions would hinder their economy, that they wouldn't reduce them at all. Is that what, what it mean? What it meant? That's what the law said. But the premise that you just described was universally accepted then. And it's universally accepted today, more or less. Everybody believes that limiting emissions hurts the economy. In fact, it can be made to do exactly the opposite. Limiting emissions and, in fact, reducing CO2 from the atmosphere altogether can help the economy. And it can mean economic progress and more jobs. Am I being clear? Well, yeah, what I don't understand is, so in your example earlier, you said that there were certain countries that did really well. They reduced their emissions by, I believe, 20%, um, and they didn't suffer economic loss. So what did they do? Did they just simply reduce their emissions? Did they replace them with renewables? Like, how did they do it so that they didn't suffer any economic loss? All of the above. Uh, one, there were critical changes in the use of energy. And in some cases, it might have hurt their economy a bit, but not much. So the discovery that it is possible to uh, prevent catastrophic climate change without hurting the economy is real. And it was demonstrated by the Kyoto Protocol. But in the year 1997, the law that I mentioned, Bert Hegel, that, was, that passed unanimously in Congress, both in the House and the Senate, was based on the assumption that the opposite was true. And even if you talk with anybody in the street today or in the US government, they will tell you that limiting emissions and the Kyoto Protocol and carbon markets hurts the economy. And they're wrong. They are wrong. Okay, I understand. So what, what, what kind of learnings did we get from the nations that prospered under the... Uh you know, the, the cap and trade, what did they do that had the biggest beneficial effect? You know, was it just, there had to be an effect from additional jobs plus uh, renewables plus, you know, a whole bunch of other factors or were there a few factors that really made a, a, the biggest difference? The um, countries that adopted the carbon market did not have the technology to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and sell it at a profit. So they could be more or less equal or a little bit worse than before, but not much. What Global Thermostat did, which was my design, is adopt the mission of creating and implementing commercially a technology that removes CO2 from air in a profitable way. So the CO2 is removed from air and it is sold in a trillion dollar market according to McKenzie, for this decade. And that market allows to sell the CO2 that you take from air and make a profit. So now you can actually clean the atmosphere and make money, not just not suffer a loss. You can actually make money out of the process. Examples are, yeah, that's our technology. The technology removes CO2 from air very inexpensively, and the carbon market at this time is not necessary for the technology to do that. 
the technology really mines the atmosphere, removes the CO2 from the atmosphere and uses that CO2 on Earth, in the surface of Earth, and stabilizes it on Earth for commercial purposes, such as carbonated beverages like uh, Coca-Cola, uh, desalinating water from the ocean like Aqua and Saudi Aramco do, the production of synthetic fuels like synthetic gasoline made from CO2 and from hydrogen, which are exactly molecule by molecule identical to gasoline, but don't emit CO2. I mentioned these three examples because Global Thermostat is commercially making CO2 and selling it for carbonated beverages, for desalinated water, and for clean gasoline already with the companies I already mentioned. So this is possible and is happening. We can actually use the CO2 that we remove from air in a way that is very similar to the one we use for removing petroleum from under the earth and using it for economic purposes. CO2 replaces petroleum. So CO2 is a very valuable gas that can replace petroleum to produce a lot of uh, goods and services, including clean polymers, including biofertilizers, including beverages and food, and including, as I said before, the salinated water and synthetic fuels. That's exactly what Global Thermostat does. So is this technology um, carbon neutral because the, the carbon dioxide is going to be used and released again later, or is it actually carbon negative? The technology is carbon negative. The carbon may not be released later, may never be released. For example, let's say that you produce polymers. Um, this is a biodegradable polymers, which is biodegradable plastic from CO2. For example, you use it in IKEA furniture. Well, that IKEA furniture is made of air. It's made of CO2 from air then, and it never goes back to the atmosphere again. It just stays here. So it's not, it's not carbon neutral, it's carbon negative, a term that I created initially years ago, and furthermore, um, I trademarked carbon negative. So you oh, wow. okay. carbon negative technologies. That is, that's what we need to do now, carbon negative technologies, yeah. So uh, what can you say about uh, this carbon sequestration or you know, removal from the atmosphere? I know, I know some of it's probably proprietary, but do you have to put it near a point source of carbon dioxide emission, or can you just have it sit anywhere? I mean, it's, I don't know if there's enough carbon in the air or carbon dioxide in the air to make it worthwhile unless it's near a, you know, an emission of uh, concentrated CO2. Our technology can do both. We can remove CO2 from a chimney emission in a factory, some industrial emission, or we can remove the CO2 directly from pure air, from the atmosphere. We don't need a point source. And because CO2 is distributed uniformly, around the surface or in the atmosphere of the planet, then you can actually produce CO2 and remove it from the atmosphere directly anywhere. That process is called direct air capture, and it is considered to be the only way that we are ever going to overcome catastrophic climate change. According to the United Nations, according to the National Academy of Sciences, and even according to the uh, other sources in uh, U.S. security, or even the Pentagon. Direct air capture means so, we clean the atmosphere of CO2, and we can do it anywhere because CO2 is distributed uniformly in the atmosphere. It is right now the same concentration in New York than it is in Beijing or Madrid. So uh, what's the ideal place for these uh, direct air capture machines to be? You know, I think that marrying them with a point source would be the juiciest place for them to mine the carbon dioxide. You know, or is it in a, um, 
you know, in a very rural area where there's not much going on? Like, like what's ideal? Actually, what is ideal is to take it directly from air. Because if you take it from a point source, then the best you can do, let's say from a chimney, is to make that chimney carbon neutral, right? So that it doesn't emit anything. But if you take it from air, directly from air, then you can remove the CO2 that is already there. And therefore, you have a carbon negative technology. You can reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere. And right now, because we emitted so much CO2 and we delayed so long in adopting the carbon market or the Kyoto Protocol, etc., right now, the only way to prevent catastrophic climate change is remove, removing massive amounts of CO2 directly from air. It does not suffice to remove it from a point source because those can be at best carbon neutral. We need to be very carbon negative. We need to remove a lot of CO2 that is already there. Am I being clear? Yeah, but what would be, um, is, there, is there an ideal place to place these uh, carbon capture machines? Like, you know, is it better to have a whole cluster of them in one spot or disperse them uniformly around the world? Like, what's the ideal? Currently, we are working with large companies such as ExxonMobil uh, and um, with um, Saudi Aramco and several others on finding out what is the best way to scale up. In other words, to remove 40 gigaton of CO2 from the atmosphere, which is what the United Nations and the US National Academy of Sciences compute that is needed to be removed every year in order to um, prevent catastrophic climate change. So we're trying to discover, is it better to do it in many small plants like we do with windmills that produce electricity in many small units? Or shall we have a huge facility or a combination of, of both? We don't know, we don't know yet. But for example, with ExxonMobil, we are in the process of, uh, you know, in a project in which we have signed agree agreements and projects to remove one gigaton of CO2. And after we have done that, and that's not tomorrow morning, I will let you know and we can answer the question in more detail. At present, we can build large facilities and many small facilities. Our technology is very modular, both. Well, in the local area around a carbon capture device, though, you would create a deficit of CO2. So what would that do to local uh, plants? You know, what if they're in, a, in an environment where they have a deficit of CO2? Would that retard their growth? Could that damage crops? You know, could that, would that lead to a higher percentage of oxygen and make things more flammable? I mean, or is it not that drastic? I guess I was not clear. I'm going to say it now for the third time. CO2 distributes, distributes very uniformly on the entire atmosphere of the planet. It is the same concentration in New York, in Beijing, or in Madrid, or in the South Pole, or the North Pole, for that matter. And it mixes very thoroughly and distributes uniformly very quickly. So there is never deficit of CO2. The CO2 distributes uniformly. If I remove the CO2 from the atmosphere above my building, once I remove the CO2, the rest of the atmosphere by itself, for physical reasons, obligingly brings a lot of CO2 from the rest of the atmosphere and equates the CO2 concentration above my building and everywhere else very quickly. Am I clear? Yeah, I guess, I, you know, it's like spinning in the ocean. There's such a vast atmosphere around us at all times that any CO2 you pull out of it would immediately be replaced by the surrounding CO2. Yeah, because of the fact that CO2 concentration is uniform, which is a peculiarity of the gas. For example, sulfur dioxide doesn't have that property. For example, nitrogen does not have that property. It's a property unique to CO2. 
And if you look at other markets, like the, CO, the SO2 market, sulfur dioxide, in the Chicago Board of Trade, that was very successful in controlling and eliminating acid rain, they're dealing with a gas that does not mix thoroughly equally everywhere, does not. So if I clean the SO2 from the air in New York City, Chicago can be very, very polluted. But that is not the case with CO2. If I clean it from New York, I'm cleaning it from Chicago. At the same time, it equates, the CO2 concentration equates very, very quickly. It occurs with CO2, it does not occur with SO2, nitrogen, and other gases. This is a peculiarity of CO2, which is actually very valuable because it means that nature is continuously moving CO2 in a way that favors the removal of CO2 because it brings it back to the areas where there is a deficit and you don't have to do anything or pay for it. It's a physics property of the atmosphere of the planet and the gas CO2. So that is what is important to know. It's almost magical, but that's true. That's what's happening. Okay. Well, very good. Um, what, what's the next level of iteration in your carbon capture you know, equipment? What, what do you want to be able to do that you can't do just yet? Or is it good enough and you just want to expand and scale? No, we are not satisfied. We need to do more. Uh, at present, we have built three plants, and the third one, which is commercial, is on the way to be used by the Coca-Cola company uh, for its bottlers. They have 950 bottlers, so they need a lot of those, and that's great. And the next step is to produce thousands and tens of thousands of them with large engineering firms. For example, um, Siemens, so that we're going to be doing that next, soon. However, as I said before, uh, this takes care of millions of tons of CO2, but we need to take care of billion, with B as in boy. A billion tons of CO2 is called a gigaton. So the next step, and that's an agreement that we have already signed um, last year, and we are already executing on, we are on the second part of that agreement now with ExxonMobil, is to remove a gigaton of CO2. And that's not going to happen, as I said, tomorrow morning, but we are in the process of increasing from several thousand tons to several million tons, and eventually to a billion tons of CO2, which is with the National Academy of Sciences and with the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, both say must be done is the only way that we can stop catastrophic climate change now. The only way. Planting trees is not fast enough. Nothing is fast enough except removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Exactly what I'm describing here must be done it is the only way to prevent catastrophic climate change. So what I'm telling you is actually uh, quite impressive because it means that a lot of things are needed, a lot of things are useful, and certainly planting trees is extremely important for biodiversity, and cleaning the ocean is very important for the origin of life in the planet, etc. However, the only way we are going to stop catastrophic climate change, which is expected this century, is by massive removal of CO2 towards the end of the century. It's going to have to be massive. How massive? It's going to be, as I said, in the tens of billion tons of CO2 that must be removed directly from air every year. So, so what a, a, an estimate would be like 40 gigatons a year removal would keep us at a comfortable level, or would that actually, you know, make us go backwards in a good way in terms of CO2? Would it reduce CO2 around the world to the point where our, uh, our, our climate would improve? Yes, 40 gigaton is believed to keep us uh, at the level where we are now, or a little bit below that. And we are above 400 parts per million 
and 425 parts per million, which is considered to be very soon catastrophic. We are already in that regime. So yes, we need to do that every year to stay below, just below where we are now. Is there enough of a market for the for you know gigatons and gigatons of carbon or CO two that would be sequestered? You know, you said it can go into you know drinks, sodas, and a bunch of other places. But is there enough of a market for that much CO two? I did not get to give you the complete list, and the complete list includes uh, materials that I didn't mention, and that we a global thermostat are not yet selling such, I, I did mention polymer, but I didn't mention cement or something called uh, aggregate, which is like a cement with stone in it, which is the biggest building material used on the planet right now to build roads and buildings, etc. Nor did I mention, because of I didn't mention everything, carbon fiber, which can replace all the um, all the metals, for example, aluminum and steel. So carbon fiber can be made with CO2. Polymers, biodegradable polymers are made of CO2. And aggregate can be made also with CO2. And the market for aggregate is large enough that right now, and particularly during this coming decade where we are, the decade starting 2020, can absorb all the CO2 that is needed and bring it down from air, from the atmosphere, and solidify it uh, so that it's stable on the earth through, for example, as I said, aggregates um, and uh, other materials, uh, including carbon fibers, which are incredibly important this century. As I, you probably know that all boats are made with carbon fiber. They don't use any metals. And there are many automobiles that are made with carbon fiber. Carbon fiber can replace right. the metals. And just the, mar- the market for steel, which is over a trillion dollars a year, can be totally replaced from the CO2 that we remove from air by carbon fiber. I'm, I'm just giving you perhaps more examples than you want, but no, that's great. That's great. So there's plenty of uses for all the, the CO2 that you could ever capture. It sounds like, which is great. There is maybe not this morning, but certainly in the course of this decade, yes. However, we have to deliberately plan the economy to be able to make the economy circular, so that. We need to remove the CO2 from the atmosphere, bring it down, stabilize it on Earth in a way that it doesn't go back up and create all the materials and the chemicals that we need, which are a lot, uh, for our growing economy and population. Actually, you can produce proteins from CO2. You can produce uh, meat, which is purely based on on CO2. I mean, it's, it's a meat. Huh. Yes. So essentially, we could remove CO2 from air and feed the population of the world and also provide water because CO2 is needed for the desalination of water. So everything I'm telling you seems a little bit like science fiction, but it's all real. And we better get going and do it because that's what we need to do. So you see, I... I have my job cut out for me and our company's mission. And I have to say, it's incredibly busy to go after that objective that I mentioned, that mission of removing CO2 and producing the CO2 um, commercially profitably on earth, stabilizing it. So it essentially uh, reverses climate change. That is the mission of our company. And we are getting there. Okay. This year, we, we have, the, I mentioned some of our clients, which are fantastic, the best brands in the world. And this year, we have 25 million in revenues. And, you know, this for a small company like ours, that's very important. And we haven't, we haven't really started uh, in big scale yet. 
So we expect there will be a lot of work, continue to be a lot of work, but we're very encouraged that we would be doing something without which human beings probably cannot survive. In other words, the general fear is that climate change is actually the worst existential risk that human beings face now, and it exceeds atomic warfare. So we better do something with that and do it very soon. And if you, what you do is also helpful to the economy and creates jobs and food and water and materials and helps the development of the economy, well, then that's what we should be doing. And that's what I'm doing. Uh, even though there is other things I would like to do in my research as a mathematician and an economist, and I'm doing it, but I feel this is a uh, number one uh, mission and, in fact, the moral obligation. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Graciela, what's the best way for people to learn more about your work and uh, biothermostat or global thermostat? I'm sorry. Okay. Well, uh, global thermostat has a website. I am told that it's a handsome website. I think it is. So you could go to globalthermostat.com and learn about this. And you could also look in, perhaps in Google, because we have what appears to be a significant um, social media as well as, uh, uh, generally speaking, virtual presence. Um, and therefore, you can learn a lot through looking at our videos, uh, of which we have done many, and other people have done it through interviews, like the one that we're doing, for which we thank you, thank you very much, and comments from other people about what the firm does. We recently got an award from um, um, MIT Technology Review that was curated by Bill Gates, naming our technology among the top 10 breakthrough technologies in the world in the year 2019. So it's recognized that this is a very important technology and that our mission is a very important mission. You can read more by looking online, but if you have any questions, we'd like to show you our plans, how they work, operating right now in Silicon Valley or in Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma. We are happy to I have visitors and discussions. And uh, we have also many private investors that we are very proud of and very grateful for. So contact our firm, globalthermostat.com. Contact me or anybody else that you uh, have questions for. We, I think we need to work with everybody. It's not sufficient to just go in a corner and do it yourself. You have to create a community of people finding solutions mm -hmm. to climate change. Well, very good. Well, Graciela, thank you for coming, and, and I appreciate it. And it's uh, you know, amazing work that you're doing. So thank you very much. Thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.